Hello, everyone. My name is Craig, and I'm going to be your host for today's SDK virtual training on Apollo Recreated. And I'm located at headquarters in Exton, Pennsylvania, with a few engineers ready to answer your questions. Uh, those engineers in the room with me today are Shannon and Jens, and then we have Nova joining us remotely. So we have you very well covered on uh, those questions that you may have. This training does require 11.6, and if you do not have 11.6 SDK installed on your machine, you can use our SDK web feature. It is a browser-based SDK, which you can use uh, Firefox, Chrome, Internet Explorer, etc. And the details for getting the web trial up and running are in the chat panel, so feel free to jump on that. Uh, we do encourage questions, so if you're falling behind or have a question on something that Austin taught, please ask using that questions panel. Somewhere on your screen, you should see the GoToWebinar window, and in that window, there is a questions panel. And uh, when you type your question on that screen, we will answer it as quickly as possible. We do have a few of you on the line as I'm looking over at the uh, screen right now, and uh, so please be patient as we try to answer all questions as fast as we can. All right, I've talked way too much. It's time for Austin to talk way too much. All right, can you hear me? Sounds good. Okay. Um, thanks, Craig. Uh, as Craig said, uh, if you don't have 11.6 installed, uh, please uh, go to the chat um, and go to webinar. Um, and there is a link, uh, licensing.agi.com uh, forward slash training, so you can follow along uh, virtually uh, through SDK Frame. Uh, that link, uh, licensing.agi.com uh, uh, forward slash training, um, is where you want to go, and you want to grab the um, handout uh, recreating Apollo.pdf um, in the go to webinar. Um, the go to webinar. So go ahead, grab the training PDF as well as go to licensing.aji.com forward slash training. And then once you're there, this uh, page will pull up. Uh, this is going to allow you to do the training um, through a web browser. Uh, and you can either, if you already have SDK 11.6, you can do it through an installed version, or you can start um, SDK now through the web browser. So you'd click this button, and a desktop would pop up uh, with SDK. I'm going to go ahead and close this one because I'm going to do mine locally. But if you'd like, uh, please click, uh, go to licensing.aj.com for slash training, and then click start SDK now to get a web browser version. Uh, so once you're there, uh, and once you have the PDF downloaded, um, what you're going to do is open up the PDF, um, and we're going to go to page one, uh, and we're going to be recreating the Apollo 11 mission today. Um, what the goal for today is to give you a little bit of background um, and give you a little bit of the setup. So this is a scenario that uh, I've already pre-built and set up, and we're just going to walk through and fill out some of the key important steps um, and show you how you could uh, rebuild the trajectory um, in Astrogator uh, using the original um, public mission data. So that's the goal for the day, and uh, we're going to launch. We're going to go uh, through translunar injection, the translunar journey, um, do a mid-course correction, get an orbit around the moon, um, and then circularize in preparation for next week's lessons where we actually land on the moon. So once you have the uh, PDF pulled up, um, recreating Apollo 11 using SDK, um, and again, this is uh, in a month and two weeks. It'll be in a month and a week or so. It'll it will be the um, the fiftieth anniversary uh, of the uh, first Apollo Eleven moon landing. So um, that's what this is for, and uh, I'm glad you're here to celebrate it with me. Okay. So uh, once you have SDK open, uh, if you could uh, click um, open a scenario. And then instead of opening locally, we're going to open, um, go to the SDK data federate. That's where the scenario is saved. So the steps for that are um, on page four of the uh, training manual. So we're going to click uh, the SDK data federate. And then if you get prompted with a login page, um, just continue as guest. And then uh, click on the tab browse. Uh, go to the folder called Sites, uh, AGI Support, Documentation Library, Virtual Training, and Apollo 11 Part 1. Expand that folder. So there's a folder called uh, Recreating Apollo 11 Part 1. Go ahead and open that 
open that guy up. And that, that path um, is in the tutorial as well. So give it a moment, and while that uh, scenario downloads, um, I'm just going to kind of walk you through a little bit of the background. Uh, so this uh, all started, um, at least the launch started in uh, July 16th of 1969. Uh, we're going to start off at Kennedy Space Center. Um, we're going to end up moving the landing location to be in the middle of the launch pad on 39A. Uh, and then we're going to take off. Um, so while that's still downloading, I'm going to also cover um, some common terms that are going to be used throughout this uh, scenario. Um, CM, which would refer to the command module. Um, SM would be the service module. So the command module is where the crew is going to spend most of their time um, going to and from the moon. Uh, the CSM would typically just be a combination of the command and service module. Um, the service module is going to be used for propulsion as well as um, like uh, power for the uh, command module um, and various other lights, life support, uh, life support and things that allow the mission to happen. Um, it's it's providing most of the thrust throughout this um, throughout the mission. Uh, the lunar module that's what goes down and touches the moon. It's comprised of two stages: the descent and ascent stage. So the descent and ascent stage are going to go down. Um, to the lunar surface. This descent will be firing the entire time. Um, and when uh, Neil and um, uh, Buzz Aldrin leave, uh, they're just going to bring the ascent stage with them to rendezvous back with the command service module in a lunar orbit. Um, another couple acronyms are the S1C, S, uh, S2, and S4B. Those are the three stages of the Saturn V rocket. Um, and they're the other... Another acronym is TLI, um, which is Translunar Injection. Um, so after they, uh, after the crew is in orbit around the Earth, they perform a maneuver called Translunar Injection. It's about a six-minute burn, um, and that's what puts them on their um, translunar trajectory to go to the moon. Uh, from there, they'll perform a mid-course correction um, just to make sure they approach the moon as planned. Um, they will then do LOI, which is Lunar Orbit Insertion, so they'll get captured um, by lunar gravity. Um, once they're there, they'll circularize, and then later uh, they will um, perform DOI, Descent Orbit Insertion. Um, the last couple 12 or 13 minutes of the landing are called PDI, which is Powered Descent Initiation. Um, and then the last few acronyms here, uh, once they lift off the lunar surface, uh, the co it sequence initiation, um, constant differential height. Those are terms used um, that the Apollo crew um, and ERA used for rendezvousing with um, the, the service module in orbit. And we'll cover these more in detail. Um, you don't need to memorize any of these. Uh, but the, the last two are terminal phase, um, which again used for the lunar rendezvous, and TEI, which is the trans-Earth injection. So the first few you might, you might hear, and we'll probably mention a lot, the last couple are specifically for landing in ascent. Okay. So once your scenario has loaded, um, we're going to go ahead and do a file uh, save as. I'm going to go ahead and save this file locally um, instead of saving it uh, back to the SDF. So I'm going to go and save this file locally. I'm going to go to my documents, SDK 11, um, I would call mine recreate. I'm would call mine recreating Apollo 11. Um, I'm going to change the file type to be a .sc. Um, you could leave the file type; either is okay. But I, I prefer working with .sc. Um, I think I already have a scenario called Apollo 11, uh, recreating Apollo 11. So I'm just going to tack on an underscore one. But everyone else, you can leave it as Apollo 11 uh, .sc. All right. Let's see if I can. Do a little bit of window management there. Okay. So as you can see, we are um, at Kennedy Space Center um, in Florida, uh, Cape Canaveral. And what we're going to do now is move um, Kennedy Space Center, uh, Center into the uh, onto the launch pad, a launch pad 39A. Um, so that's where the Saturn rocket actually launched from. Um, if we follow along the steps, um, these are going to be the next, the first couple steps. It's called under the edit the location of Kennedy Space Center. So if you open up the properties of Kennedy Space Center by right-clicking on it and clicking properties, 
Uh, the default values of lat longitude, those would be um, generic coordinates for the Space Center. What we want to use is the specific um, coordinates of the launch. So from this tutorial, I would recommend copying and pasting uh, these values into SDK. I wouldn't recommend typing them all out, but that is a perfectly valid option as well. Uh, so the latitude, these are the precise coordinates, 28.6 um, and some degrees latitude and negative 80.6 uh, and some degrees longitude and uh, zero feet altitude. Then we're going to click OK. Uh, and once we do that, you'll notice that Kendi Space Center has moved, um, and it's going it's moved into the center of the pad. So if I were to right click and then zoom to Kennedy Space Center in the Earth view, uh, you can see it is now in the center of the launch pad where the Saturn V rocket took off. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is model the launch. So uh, open up the properties of the Saturn V. Um, and inside the properties, we're going to go to the first um, the first tab, the basic orbit tab. And this is where Astrogators, the MCS is, the mission control sequence. Um, and what we have is a pre-configured uh, se target sequence here called target launch. Um, we have a launch segment and a propagate to TLI. Um, so the idea behind this launch segment um, is we're going to launch using the nominal values um, from some of the uh, mission data available to us. Um, and then we're going to adjust those values slightly um, so that we end up in the right location um, for translunar injection. So if you go to the PDF, there's uh, actually a link to the Apollo 11 mission report. I would recommend go ahead and opening that. That is on page 3 at the bottom of page 3 called uh, Mission Report. Uh, it says the values, uh, all the, most of the values that I used throughout this recreation um, came from this mission report. So you can click this Apollo 11 um, link and it hyperlinks you to the Apollo 11 mission report. So I'd recommend going and opening that. Um, I'm just going to pull that up on my screen. So this table, uh, figure 7-2, uh, the trajectory parameters from the Apollo 11 mission reports, what I used to create most of uh, this recreation. These are the values that we're going to be targeting. Um, for particular the launch, um, I used a reference called Apollo 11 by the numbers, um, and they have um, the end state of the launch. Um, so we're going to use that um, for modeling here. So these values, um, let's see, at the end of the launch, uh, this line right here, the S4B uh, turns off. Uh, that happens 11 minutes and 40 seconds into um, the launch, we have an altitude, uh, a earth fixed velocity, uh, a space fixed velocity, um, the lat longitude of when they cut out, as well as the flight path angle and a heading relative to north. Um, so this is where I got the data for the first launch sequence. So if we go to the training manual, those numbers are already in here for us. So what we're going to do um, is end up using those uh, values and populate the launch segment. Okay, uh, but before we do that, uh, we're going to move the launch uh, to actually start um, on the top of the launch pad. So click on the launch segment, go to um, select facility, and then select Kennedy Space Center from that drop-down list. And then we're going to click OK. Uh, this will now move the lat longitude um, to the uh, precise location of the Kennedy Space Center. And then the next thing we're going to do is actually give this an altitude offset of 310 feet. That's the approximate height of the command and service module inside the um, Saturn V rocket. Uh, so they're not directly on the launch pad. They're up in the air about uh, 310 feet or so. And next what we're going to do is click on the... Um, we're going to click on the spacecraft parameters tab. And so this, uh, now we're going to update the mass of the Saturn V rocket to be representative of the um, actual mass for the mission. 
Uh, so the dry mass was approximately uh, 50, 53,900 kilograms. So update that value. This is on page five of the training PDF. And then if we go to the fuel tank tab, um, we're going to also update the uh, fuel mass. Uh, so I'd recommend changing the uh, maximum fuel mass first or else you'll get a warning message uh, saying you can't have more fuel than your maximum fuel mass. And we're going to change it to a value of uh, 76,600 kilograms. Then I'm just going to copy and paste that value for the uh, fuel mass as well. So our max fuel mass is 76,600 kilograms, and our fuel mass um, is the same value. Okay, now that we are on the, um, on the launch pad and we have the Saturn uh, V rocket appropriately sized, and that includes uh, the command module, service module, the lunar module, all the crew, um, and all the fuel of the rocket, uh, that's all taken into account here. Uh, we're going to set the burnout parameters. So I'd recommend going to the table on page 6. Um, and we're going to set the end state of our burn as well as the time. I'd recommend copying and pasting those values uh, into Astrogator under the burnout tab. So the launch itself um, took just under 700 seconds. So that's about 11 minutes and 40 seconds. Uh, and then we're going to copy the latitude value, uh, paste it in, and do the same for the rest of the values in this table. And these values come directly um, from uh, either the Apollo 11 mission report or in this one case from the Apollo 11 um, by the numbers. So that we're uh, copying um, data that's publicly available to us um, and using that to uh, target these end states of the burn um, of where the crew actually went. So after you copy and paste the values uh, into the burnout tab, right beneath it there's a burnout velocity so the first describes the location of the end of the launch segment. The second describes uh, how fast we're moving and the direction. So go ahead and copy those values over as well. It's going to be just over 25,000 feet per second. Uh, so we're moving about like five miles a second or so uh, at the end of this launch. Um, and then we have a 88 uh, degree um, direction. Uh, inertia velocity azimuth, and a near circular orbit of 0 0.001 for the flight path angle. All right, so once you finish copying those, uh, we're going to go back. Um, we're going to move on to a different segment. So this is our initial guess for where the uh, launch ended. But what we want to do is actually make sure that um, the launch occurs and it puts us in a spot uh, so we're in the right spot for TLI. So what we're going to do now is click on Prop to TLI. And we're going to update that time. Um, the time of TLI, uh, if you go to the bottom of page 6, you're going to want to copy the value and paste it in. It happened 2 hours and 44 minutes um, after, uh, after the Saturn V's engines ignited. Um, that is going to be the time when they start their translunar injection uh, to burn and go to the moon. So we want to make sure they're in the right spot, um, and our launch puts us in the right location. Uh, so we're just going to update the time for the translunar injection start, and we're going to target some values. So if you click Prop to TLI, click Results, once you've updated this epic uh, trip value. We're going to go down to the folder called Geodetic. And then we're going to move over three values, uh, altitude, latitude, and longitude. You'll notice there are some yellow and green um, calculation objects here. Uh, the yellow is going to be default. Uh, we're just going to move over altitude, um, latitude, and longitude. Uh, don't move over the green values. We'll use those later um, as we go through and get closer to the moon. These are custom calculation objects uh, that we've pre-configured for you, um, and those are in reference to the moon instead of the Earth. But right now, since we're in, uh, still in the Earth, we're going to use altitude, latitude, and longitude. 
The other folder, we're going to scroll down uh, to Spherical Elements. And we're going to move over uh, three more values. Uh, this time, we are going to use one of these green values that um, was um, customly set up. Uh, this one's called Flight Path Angle Custom. Move that one over. Scroll down about halfway to VMAG Custom. That's the Velocity Magnitude um, Custom. And then come down to uh, Velocity Azimuth Custom. And so the reason why we have custom on all these, those are just the names I happen to give it. But if you look at the coordinate system, uh, it's this Earth B1950 coordinate system. Uh, so it turns out when I was recreating this mission, um, they used uh, coordinate frames from like 1967 because the launch itself happened in 1969. Uh, all these update more modern uh, coordinate frames didn't really come around to like the 80s and then uh, time after that. So uh, they were using different coordinate frames. So all these values expressed in the Apollo uh, 11 mission report um, are not going to be in the Earth inertial frame. And when I went to go rebuild and this trajectory, I couldn't get the values to converge unless I used uh, older coordinate frames, which line up more closely um, with the original mission data. Okay, so that is uh, why we have custom flight path angles, velocity, and uh, velocity azimuth. It's because they're in reference to a um, an older coordinate frame, which was much uh, closer to the values listed in this mission report. Okay, once we're done with that, we're just going to click OK. Then we're going to click on Target Launch and open up the properties of target launch. Um, open up the properties of the differential corrector by double-clicking. You can uh, also double-click the status over here so you don't accidentally edit the name field. Then a window is going to pop up. Um, we are going to now use the values uh, for the start of the TLI, translunar injection. Um, so we're going to copy the values on page 7 into the results section here. So they ended at a uh, altitude of 105.8 nautical miles. Um, and back then, uh, the crew were um, had, uh, either were used to flying planes, and back then they used nautical miles uh, was the uh, preferred unit. Uh, that's about 1.15 regular miles. Um, I'm not going to try to do the unit two kilometers, but uh, it's a little less than two, I believe. So the end result um, of this orbit is about a 200-kilometer orbit, um, 1.85 nautical miles. I'm just going to keep on filling these values out. It's pretty circular. Um, it ended at 5 degrees south for latitude and 172 degrees east. So once you've done uh, copy, uh, what you've copied all these values over, go ahead and click Use for each one of these values. We're going to end up targeting them all. And uh, one other trick um, that uh, I'm just going to – one of the lesser-known things about Astrogator is uh, when we change units – so I have uh, nautical miles and feet, so two different representations um, of distance units – you can actually click this custom display unit right next to the checkbox. Then if you click this display unit field, click this um, the unit button, you have to click the uh, display unit field and then click the unit button over here on the right. Uh, you can drop down and select nautical miles. Um, that's not essential. But what that does is it'll make sure that this desired values remains um, in the units you entered it in or in the uh, custom display units you prefer as well as the current value. So I can see altitude uh, in nautical miles, and I can keep my velocity down here in feet per second. Okay. Um, so make sure all of these are enabled. Make sure these values are entered. Um, and then we're going to come down here, click OK. Uh, what we're going to do now is run the mission sequence. So go ahead and click the green Run button. A targeter should pop up, and it should converge in a few iterations. If it if you're having trouble converging, um, walk back through the steps and make sure you didn't miss any. And uh, if you're still having trouble, please uh, send us a question in chat. Um, and Yens will try to help you out. Uh, so you can see uh, that mine converged in three iterations. Um, 
we are uh, now have hit the desired end state uh, within the tolerances we want. So if you want to view that, I'm going to click close on this um, target panel. I'm going to click this uh, clear graphics button, this black button. What that does is it wipes out all of the um, other trajectories that weren't used. Uh, all the ones that use for targeting, it displays all of them, but by default, so we're going to clear those with that black button. So we're going to click OK. Uh, and then what we're going to do is just go ahead and save our scenario. So do a control S. Um, you can also come up here to where it says file uh, and do file save. Um, the other option is, um, so you can do file save. Uh, you could add in the default uh, menu bar back. Um, I tried to delete all the menu bars I'm not using. Um, you can add in that default menu bar back and there's this save uh, floppy disk icon, um, something I'm not too familiar with, floppy disks. Uh, but there's a couple of ways to save. So control S, uh, file save, uh, floppy disk icon. Okay. Our intention with this training was not to make everyone feel old, though. <laughs> I do remember what floppy disks are, so have no fear. <laughs> All right. Uh, so now uh, if we look at what we've done so far, um, what I would recommend doing is actually I have a bunch of Stored views pre-configured for you so you don't have to keep on jumping around different panels. Make sure this Earth 3D graphics is the main window pulled up. Then we're going to click this uh, black uh, arrow drop down right next to the, um, it looks like an eyeball, the little, uh, I guess, white cube beside it. There's a drop down list. And what we're going to do is jump to the uh, launch, um, the launch stored view. That's a marshmallow, in case you were wondering. Thanks, Greg. I, I don't think it is actually a marshmallow, but it looks like a marshmallow to me. <laughs> Definitely does. Okay. Um, so click the eyeball with the marshmallow beside it. Uh, then click the launch for the stored uh, view. And then just go ahead and animate your scenario. And now you can move around. Uh, and you can see we were launching. Um, so we've launched out of Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we are now entering um, an orbit. About two minutes, uh, 30 or 40 seconds in, um, the first stage would actually fly off of the Saturn V rocket. Um, and then about nine minutes in, the second stage flies off. Uh, I'm just going to pause my scenario and jump to the end state of the launch. That is another stored view. So I'm going to jump to end of launch. Um, this is uh, the red trajectory, by the way, is when um, something is burning. Um, so it now switches to green. Uh, because the upper stage has stopped burning at this point. So the first stage burns, the second stage burns, the upper stage, the S4B, um, that burns for about two minutes or so before cutting off. Um, and now we are in orbit around the Earth. So you can see uh, we are about 13 minutes in. They continue doing this to 2.44, uh, the time we set... Um, for the translunar injection. So if we come down the stored view, click on translunar injection. Uh, and this is our end state right now. Um, so we've orbited the um, Earth about two times or so. Um, and we're there. This is the location where they're going to start. The S4B is going to kick in again. Um, and it's going to start and burn um, and take us to the moon. So one thing you'll notice, this trajectory is actually displayed in the uh, Earth fixed frame. That's why um, these uh, trajectory lines don't lie on more on top of each other. Um, for uh, the next segment, the service module, we're actually going to switch to the Earth um, inertial frame for displaying uh, its orbit. And we also have another window down here in the bottom called the Earth-Moon rotating frame. Uh, that way you can see the more iconic figure eight trajectory that most people are accustomed to seeing. Okay, so moving on. Uh, let's open up the properties of the service module. So in the, uh, in the service module, um, the first thing you're going to see is this stop, uh, move as needed. Um, and basically the intention with this is as we go and fill out the values uh, throughout the mission control sequence, we're just going to move that stop segment down 
um, beneath what we've given the okay for like this is good this is all set up and configured so we're going to end up dragging and dropping uh, this stop segment down as we go all right so for the um, for the first part here uh, I'm just gonna walk you through this real quick if I look at um, if I look at the first segment it's a follow segment and what this is is the sat the service module is following the Saturn V. Um, so it's following the launch, uh, and I've specified the joining and separation conditions. Um, if we come and look at the time here, that's the time um, of TLI. Uh, the just just to be clear, the um, Saturn V and the service module don't actually separate uh, physically until later. Um, the reason why I'm doing the separation now is just purely for orbit visualization purposes. Uh, but about uh, an hour or so after this, the um, the service module will separate uh, from the upper stages of the S4B. Okay, so that is how I've set this up. Uh, the next thing that's going to happen is the translunar injection itself. So now uh, we are at the top um, of page 9 uh, of the tutorial. Uh, we're going to click on uh, TLI, and we're going to change some of its properties. So instead of an impulsive maneuver... Um, we're going to change this to a finite maneuver. And then what we're going to do, uh, instead of this attitude control, instead of burning along the velocity vector, we're going to expand that drop down and then come down and select thrust vector. Um, you'll note that these uh, are the default values for the attitude update. It's going to update during burn, so it's going to update its uh, axes as it as it burns um, to try to stay in this velocity normal co-normal uh, velocity meaning x is the velocity direction uh, normal being the orbit normal that would be the y direction and co-normal would be the third that completes that triad um, what we're going to do now uh, is come and click this spherical button right here so we don't want to use uh, in this case uh, the cartesian elements we're going to use uh, spherical elements to represent this and we're going to click that spherical uh, spherical box or button, radio button. Um, and we're going to also turn on two parameters here to target. We're going to turn on azimuth and elevation. So click the check the target buttons for the azimuth and elevation. And then we're going to move to the engine tab. Uh, so first what we want to do is update our engine model. Instead of being this constant thrust and ISP, we're going to want to use a representative engine model, or else we're not going to get anywhere. So in those ellipses button, expand that. Uh, these are all of the um, engine models that um, are available to us. Yellow, again, are defaults, and green would be um, something that has been custom made. So I've pre-configured a lot of this uh, for you guys. So if you click the top one called Command Service Module, uh, SPS, the Service Propulsion System, um, and a model that is a constant thrust in ISP. We're going to use that uh, for our engine model. And this is um, sort of a first-order guess um, at uh, the engine model and the actual burn. It's going to be a pretty pretty close burn with uh, in about like 90% or so, 90% or so um, for the actual value since I don't have a uh, thrust profile. So we're just going to model as a constant uh, thrust in ISP. And you can see on page 9 um, how much uh, what what is the thrust of this engine um, and the estimated ISP. The ISP is probably a little high, um, but I estimated that from the amount of fuel used over its total uh, burn time. So those are rough numbers here. Um, but since they're a, a, a little a little bit off of probably the actual values that were used, what we're going to do is click this thrust efficiency. Um, and what that's going to do is allow any sort of small corrections uh, to be accounted for in the thrust efficiency. Um, and so it, it's not forced to burn exactly um, with the entire force that we've given it. It might burn just a little, a little hot or a little cold. So the last, uh, last thing we're doing in this panel is click... Uh, instead of, for this thrust value down here, instead of effects acceleration, we're going to do uh, effects acceleration and mass flow rate. Um, what that does, it says is, if this thrust efficiency is lower, let's say it's 0.9, it'll only use 0.9% uh, or 90% of the fuel. If this were to go up to like 1.1, 1 
it would use an extra 10% of the fuel. Um, if we left it as the default effects acceleration only, um, 100% of the fuel uh, for that segment would be used, um, and the, it wouldn't be uh, adjusted up or down um, if the thrust efficiency uh, knob was turned. Okay, so we have those set up. Uh, we have our thrust efficiency check. Um, we're going to now uh, click on the propagator tab. And by default, we have a duration stopping condition here. Uh, we're going to update that by clicking this new button. And we're going to add in a uh, epic stopping condition. So the reason I'm using epic for most of these values um, is if I look at the Apollo 11 mission report, um, I can see uh, the time given in mission elapsed time. Um, so 244.16, uh, and this goes to 250 in three seconds, as well as all these values. That's why we are using custom calc objects to hit these um, state vectors um, that are in um, a different uh different uh, information, not the typical like Cartesian XYZ. Um, so we're going to target these six values at these times. So we're going to enter a time of two hours, um, 50 minutes, uh, and three seconds. That is um, at the top of page 10, mission elapsed time, uh, for our epic stopping constraint, our epic stopping trip value. And then while we're here, we can go ahead and delete the uh, duration trip value. So those are where those numbers are coming from um, and how you would set them up instead of astrogator. All right, now we're going to add some results to uh, translunar injection. So if I click on TLI, the burn, click uh, results. There's already a few results I've already actually added for you, so don't feel the need uh, to delete those. I would actually recommend just leaving them there. Um, there's already some pre-configured values. It won't affect anything for targeting purposes, but it will allow you to compare more directly uh, with the mission report if you want to cross-reference it later. Okay, so we're going to come down um, to the spherical elements folder once again. Then we're going to move over flight path angle custom once again the VMAG custom, and the velocity azimuth uh, custom. Make sure you don't click the custom moon uh, because you, you, you would have the angles all wrong if you uh, have them with respect to the moon, not the earth. So be, be careful to make sure you grab the right ones here. Flight path angle, um, VMAG, and velocity azimuth. Okay. Once you have this moved over, open up the properties of your differential corrector. Go ahead and click check for the control parameters up top. Um, and then come down here to the results. And we are going to click flight path angle, uh, velocity mag, and velocity azimuth. Those are the three um, that we're going to use. We're not going to end up targeting the altitude, latitude, and longitude. Uh, as you can see, I already have the desired values entered here. Um, those are from the Paul of Mission Report, but we're not going to end up targeting those. You're just going to use them uh, for a reference to make sure we're in the right spot. Um, one thing, if you don't like to see these values, you can click this Hide Inactive button over here. So it'll only show you the checked results, the ones that are actually being targeted. So I'm going to go ahead and click the Hide Inactive to only show the results that I want to see right now. And then I'm going to enter in the values uh, from the table uh, on page 10 of the training manual, which is 6.9 one degrees for flight path angle, so we're no longer um, in a circle. Um, the velocity uh, magnitude, as well as the uh, velocity azimuth. So move those values over from the table, and we're going to target those. Uh, the last thing we're going to do uh, on this uh, difference corrector is click on thrust efficiency. So I believe the defaults um, for thrust efficiency are 0 0.1, meaning it's going to vary your thrust by 10%, but it has a really large default max step size of 500. We don't want our, uh, <laughs> our step to be adjusted by 50,000%. Um, we we want to limit that to be uh, 0 0.1, which would be about 10%, uh, because we've sized everything pretty, pretty closely. 
we want it make sure our thrust stays in the ballpark um, instead of having it move uh, really all over the place if we hadn't sized everything appropriately. Um, and then we're going to also change the perturbation to be uh, one-tenth of that. Uh, so we're going to perturb the thrust by 1% and say don't move more than 10% at a time uh, in between iterations. All right, then we're going to click OK. Once we have that all set up, um, we're going to do just a few more things before we run the mission control sequence. Uh, we're going to change the mass to represent the loss of the um, S4B after separation. So TLI happens as S4B firing. Um, and then after that, um, there's a segment called prop to S4B separation. If you just look at it, you don't have to edit anything here. Uh, if you notice, TLI ends at 2 hours and 50 minutes. Um, and then um, the S4B separation um, starts at well, it occurs at 4 hours and 40 minutes. So there's only an hour and 50 minutes or so. During this time, the command module actually um, undocks from the S4B, goes out uh, 100 feet or so, turns around as a 100AD pitch mover, comes back, pulls out the lunar module, they start to drift away, um, and then uh, they perform uh, a separation maneuver. So what we're going to do is model the change in mass um, to represent the fact that we are dropping the S4B. So on page 11, um, we are going to set the uh, dry mass value. We're going to set to new value uh, to be 25,449 kilograms. So change the value to not add or subtract, but to set to new value. And then we're going to change the fuel mass to be um, 18,410. And that is going to be the size of the command service module as well as the lunar module. Okay. So now we're going to do is propagate to the first mid cor course correction. Go to the top of your mission control sequence, grab the stop, and pull it down and drop it beneath the prop to uh, mid course correction. So what we're going to do is once we have that set up, you're just going to run your mission control sequence. It looks like I copied uh, one of these values over here wrong. Hold on one moment. I believe this uh, VMAG is probably supposed to say 25567. So let's actually edit that real quick. Hold on one moment. See, so let's open up the targeter uh, TLI. So let's actually just pull up the mission report and see what values they have in here. Okay. 35567, um, space fix angle, uh, heading direction. The only other thing that might be jumping out is uh, I might have Mrs. Steph to update the uh, command and service modules. Let's just check out uh, that thrust um, in ISP. Okay, so that is that's it. It doesn't look like I missed a step there. Um, so that's my fault, guys. So if what you can do is uh, click this um, blue button right here. Uh, for the component browser, that'll bring this window up. Um, from there, we're going to go to the uh, engine model tabs. You can click show only astrogator components and click engine model tab. Uh, and then if you click on command uh, service um, propulsion constant thrust and ISP, uh, I forgot to update these values. We need to do that. Um, so that was a step um, that I accidentally skipped over. Oh, I've, I've got my head of myself here. All right, uh, now I've reoriented myself. Okay, so uh, click uh, 90, move this 91,000 uh, newtons over. Uh, this is going to be on page 13. I'm going to go a little bit of out of order, then we'll uh, catch back up. Uh, 91,000 newtons. Uh, put that for the thrust value. And then for the ISP, uh, change this to 314. Uh, so what happened was I selected the uh, the wrong the wrong engine model. 
Um, so that so that was my fault. Uh, the command service module uh, SPS is what is going to be used for the mid course correction, and that'll be using ninety one thousand three hundred fourteen um, for the ISP. So I'll go ahead and click OK. But what I should have used for the uh, TLI was not the service repulsion. Uh, that is the S four B constant thrust uh, in ISP. So we're gonna run through that uh, one more time. Um, what the reason why it didn't converge originally is uh, I click the command uh, service um, propulsion system. So instead, go to the TLI, click on engine, then click on uh, the engine uh, expansion right here, the ellipses. Instead of uh, the CSM, we're going to click S4B constant thrust uh, in ISP because that, that's burning um, and not the command service module at this point for TLI. And then we'll go and reconfigure the other um, the other maneuver in just a moment. So I'm going to click on target TLI, click reset, and then I'm going to rerun um, my mission control sequence. So the the problem there was I cho chose the wrong engine model. Okay. So if I then click clear graphics, click apply. Uh, go ahead and save your scenario, control S. And then if we look what we've done, uh, if I, this is now the service module is going to burn. If you hit uh, the, go to the stored view, um, translunar injection, then you can click play. You can speed up just a little if you'd like. Uh, but now the uh, service module burned for about six minutes. Uh, and now, or the upper stage uh, burned for six minutes, and now the command service module as well as the upper stage are on their way to the moon. And about four hours in, um, the service module and crew form a separation mover to separate from the upper stage of the Saturn V rocket, uh, and they continue along the journey um, to the moon um, until they hit the first mid-course correction. Okay, so at this point, um, we're going to come down... Uh, to the model, the mid-course correction on page 13. Um, and if we wanted to, I'm just going to skip over this uh, step um, for the moment, but what you could do on the bottom of page 12, if you wanted to see the entire trajectory instead of just, um, I believe, like the default two hours I'm showing here, um, is what you would do is go to the properties of the service module, um, go to the um, 3D graphic orbit system tab, or uh, 3D graphics pass tab, and you could change um, the orbit track uh, type from being uh, none to be all and the trail type to be all. And what that'll do is it'll show the entire trajectory before and after uh, the service module actually gets there. Uh, but for time's sake, I'm not going to do that. Um, the steps are outlined on the bottom page 12, um, and you would get a picture um, that looks something like this. Okay, so we're going to model the uh, mid-course correction now. Uh, so if we go back to the uh, basic orbit tab, if we go back to the MCS, uh, we're going to click on the mid-course correction. Uh, and now we're going to update our uh, engine model um, for the command, and service, uh, the command and service module. So now that we're no longer using the S4B, uh, we're going to be using the command and service module for propulsion. So now if we click the component browser, go to... Um, show only astrogator components, then go to engine models. Uh, now if we edit up the, the properties of the command service module S SPS, uh, we're going to enter that value of 91,000 newtons, 314 seconds. So this is going to be used for the mid-course correction um, as well as lunar orbit uh, insertion. So once you've done that, uh, close your way out of those windows. Uh, we're going to edit the uh, mid-course correction. Um, you'll notice it is, if I click on already, it's already set up to be a finite burn, um, have the thrust vector, um, the azimuth uh, and elevation already checked. If we click the engine tab, um, we're going to make sure that uh, the engine model set up to the command service module um, constant thrust, the one we just edited, make sure it is the 91,000 um, thrust and the uh, 314 ISP, that engine model. And then if we looked at thrust efficiency, 
um, this one is checked to, to be enabled as well. So if you look at the next segment, um, this is propagate to lunar orbit insertion. Uh, we're going to make sure that this value set correctly, three days and three hours and 50 minutes. Um, you can see that's correct here. And if I open up the properties of um, the prop to LOI, uh, you can see all the values that we're going to end up targeting. Um, I'm not, we're going to look at all these values, uh, the altitude, lat longitude, as well as the velocity, azimuth, magnitude, and flight path angle. Uh, another way we can look at that is open up the differential corrector of the target lunar approach. So open up the differential corrector. You can see we're targeting the azimuth, the elevation, uh, the thrust of the maneuver, the mid-course correction, um, to hit an altitude, um, a flight path angle, uh, VMAG, and velocity. Uh, the values that we want to hit are located on page 15. So go ahead and copy over um, the next two val uh, the values from the top of 15. Uh, it approaches at 86.7 nautical miles, a flight path angle of negative uh, 9.99 a velocity of 8,250 feet per second and a uh, velocity azimuth of negative 62.8 degrees. Then we're going to click OK. Um, before I click OK, the one other thing you can do just for reference uh, is you can toggle this hide inactive and I've already filled out all the values from the Apollo 11 mission report. So after this runs and converge, you, you can come back and check how close we actually got. So we're going to move this, move as needed down beneath the translunar approach. I'm going to click run. So now what's happening, um, the crew has performed their mid-course correction, and it's going to take them um, to the moon. So last few things we're going to do today um, are insert into a lunar orbit and then do a circularization. Um, those steps are pretty quick. So I'm just going to show you uh, quickly what we have here. So if I clear the graphics, uh, and then I'm going to click the stored view, uh, I'm going to click, um, I'm actually going to switch to the moon. Uh, so instead of the Earth, I'm going to switch to the Moon. I'm going to pull up the Moon 3D graphics here. And then I'm going to click the stored view for the Moon of lunar orbit insertion. You see now the crew uh, are about to do their lunar orbit insertion uh, to insert uh, into the moon and the Moon's orbit. So in the training manual, uh, we're going to go down to page um, 15. Uh, now we're actually on page 16. Um, what we're going to do is model the lunar orbit insertion. So we'll click on LOI. Uh, you're going to note that uh, we are now using a moon propagator as well as the moon velocity normal direction. Um, the engine and propagator um, are using the appropriate engine models. Uh, it burns for the correct amount of time. Uh, and what we're going to do here is... Uh, click on target LOI. Um, click on the first differential corrector, differential corrector called LOI, uh, lunar orbit insertion, and we're going to copy the values on page 17, this 60.1 nautical miles into the bottom down here. We're going to copy the VMAG, uh, 5,479 feet per second, and the velocity azimuth, the negative 66.89 into the targeter. And we're going to click OK. And then we're going to copy the values uh, in the next chart right beneath it into the differential corrector below, the differential corrector called prop to circ. Copy those over. And you'll notice um, that uh, some of these, th these altitudes are pretty similar here. Um, let's just go ahead and finish this up. Uh, so copy those values over. Then we're going to scroll down um, to page 18. Click on Lunar Circularization. Click the Target. Uh, the, click the Circ Differential Corrector. And we're going to move over these two values.
it's we're going to be targeting in this case flight path angle uh, and velocity. Um, and then for the last one, we're going to be targeting um, a latitude of 0 0.99 and a longitude of 31.86. And as well as the velocity um, in the chart. So once we have all that set up, um, I know I went that uh, through a little quickly, but all the steps are laid out in the uh, training down here. Um, what we're going to do is move this stop as needed down uh, right above the training one. So that's going to be end of training one today. Um, and what we're going to do now is just go ahead and uh, run the entire mission control sequence. So I'm just going to walk real quickly what, uh, what we're doing here. Uh, we're targeting a lunar orbit insertion. The first uh, target LOI, what that does is targets the end state of the lunar orbit. Um, and then the second one, uh, we're going to now propagate to the beginning of our circularization. So the end state of our lunar orbit insertion was actually tweaked just a little bit uh, so that we line up at the correct lat long and location uh, for our circularization burn. Uh, then the next two differential correctors are going to target the end state of our circularization burn, and then it's going to be uh, modified slightly um, so that the crew are have now circularized and it puts um, the lunar module as well as the service module into the correct location um, for the beginning of the descent, which we're going to model next time. Uh, so at this stage, the crew are in lunar orbit. Uh, they are have circularized and they are... Uh, Neil Armstrong, um, as well as Buzz Aldrin, are in the lunar module and are preparing to go down to the lunar surface. So thank you, everyone, uh, for coming today. I'll stay on for a few moments for questions. Um, and thank you once again. Go ahead and save your scenario. Thanks, Austin. Um, that is TV writing 101 right there. He left you on a cliffhanger. We don't know if they really reached the moon or not. Well, I guess you could... Go to the Wikipedia page and find out. But uh, you can also be like me and not have any spoilers. So um, thanks again, Austin. We'll remain on the line. Oh, uh, everyone wanted me to mention that uh, this was recorded today. And we will have a recording up on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash analytical graphics. But also we have a special Apollo 11 uh, website set up. And that is at agi.com slash Apollo, where you can find Austin's webinar also on our YouTube site, but it is also on Apollo 11 and some other great fun features about some blogs and things that people have, are remembering Apollo 11. None of them are talking about Stanley Kubrick creating it in a Hollywood studio, but maybe I should do that. Um, okay, so we're, again, going to remain the line for 10 more minutes. Thanks again for joining us, and we will uh, see you hopefully next week. Thanks. Austin wants to show the full trajectory, so I'm going to send him, I'm sending the, uh, screen back to him so he can explain what's going on here and this is the full trajectory i believe thanks craig uh, just one other thing i wanted to show um to leave you guys off on a, a more of an interesting note um and see some of the cool things that we just finished um if you uh open up the 3d uh, graphics um earth moon rotating view you can see the trajectory that kind of typical figure eight pattern um, for the whole trajectory. So you'd want to click the 3D graphics uh, moon rotating, uh, click the stored view, uh, click the drop down trajectory overview. Um, and then uh, what you can do is uh, open up the properties of the service module. This is one of those steps that I highlighted, but we didn't go through. Um, and then come down to 3D graphics pass, and you can set the lead and trail type to be all. And then once you do that, um, you'll be able to see the entire trajectory uh, that the crew have taken. Um, you can also look at it in an Earth inertial window. So if I switch over to this Earth window, you'll see it in a different a different view. Um, so it kind of looks uh, like you go out and then get this kind of corkscrew effect. Um, but the more typical one uh, looks like this half of a figure eight um, and going out to the moon. You can also just play around with the windows, uh, check out the moon window, and then look at the... Uh, trajectory from um, the moon's perspective, how they enter into lunar orbit insertion. Uh, you can see this red segment right down here where they perform a small burn um, and as well as circularize 
Uh, and then we're now all set up to go uh, go for moon landing next time. Just want to highlight uh, what we've done so far and, of course, uh, save your scenario. Uh, my, my last tip, actually, is if you click on these target windows, this one's a lifesaver for big uh, astrogator sequences. If you click on this target sequence, there is a close all target windows uh, button. So that'll close all my target windows down here with one click. So that's pretty cool. Okay, thanks. I'll remain the line to answer just a few more questions. Thanks, Austin.